Okay, hello and welcome to episode 86 of the Market Maker podcast. And we've not planned this in terms of preparation of what we're specifically going to say. Uh, but I told Piers, we normally record this conversation first thing on a Friday morning, just to cut us some slack later on in the day. But um, it's been a super busy day, particularly for me being the person that's keeping a watchful eye on what's going on in markets. And that's because the UK Prime Minister, Liz Truss, has just held a, I guess you can call it an emergency <laughs> press conference, uh, because the Chancellor has been sacked earlier on today, and she just came out and made a statement. So I haven't caught up yet with you, Piers, on what you thought, but she's literally just finished. She spoke for eight minutes and took just four questions. Yeah. But what was what your, before we delve into what's been said and actually what's happened all week and what is going on, initial thoughts, what do you think? Well, the, uh, the emergency press conference, what, it finished about 20 minutes ago. Hmm. And I think I've only just stopped laughing at just the ridiculousness of all of this. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, she's, she's just, it's like a rabbit in the headlights now, isn't it? I think mm. um, she's thrown quasi under the bus. Um, fair enough. Um, but obviously the big question is, well, why didn't she throw herself under that same bus? Because it's not like this plan was quasi's, you know? Mm. It's not like he just came up with this master budget and then put it on Liz's desk just to sign off. I mean, we're led to believe this is entirely, the whole budget thing was an entirely joint endeavor, you know, a joint almost like ideology and they masterminded it together. And then, yeah, obviously it's a disaster would be a big understatement. And yeah, I, you know, someone's got to go, but yeah, how, how she can still, stay there I, I don't know but I it's hard because if she doesn't want to go which clearly she doesn't at this point remember Boris a few well a few months ago now the only way the only way he got forced out was by the cabinet just en masse resigned pretty much it was just like one after the other after the other after the other and it was like oh yeah. okay all right I don't have a choice but unless that happens I mean she's just gonna continue to wade on through this kind of this 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 swamp that she's created um what what, what did you think um, well yeah there is the um i think there's the technical process now that she can't technically be challenged because of the fact she's just come into leadership because of the time frame of the the process yeah. of what that entails however it only i read one thing saying it only takes an afternoon meeting of the backbenchers committee to then flip that rule and toss well, her out anyway so um you can't one of the things i thought with with uh, this conversation was i didn't really want to really talk about it too much because probably by yeah. monday when we yeah. have been everything would have changed so it's hard to really <laughs> say anything concrete at this point um but yeah i mean one of the things from where i sit is i have lots of different news sources and and Twitter and things like that is particularly useful to get the initial wave of what the political correspondents thought. And they are then plugged into MPs who WhatsApp them from the Conservative Party. And you get some pretty, it's pretty damning um, what's been reported in the first five minutes. Exactly like you said, rabbit in the headlights. She just kind of bolted. Yeah. <laughs> if you watched it, it was... She literally sprit. She was like, she answered <laughs> the fourth question, which was from Robert Peston, who basically said, yeah. why are you still there talking? No, he said, are you going to apologise to your party? That's right. what Peston asked. She, again, delivered a swerve. Right, so answer. the former, former Chancellor, Philip Hammond's already commented, saying he's basically just thrown the entire reputation of the Conservative Party. She's just torn it up because they're supposed to be the ones who are the fiscally prudent uh, no. of, of the political spectrum. Um, one thing, a couple other things that, that were said was that she didn't actually assign any blame to Quasi. And some were saying because of their relationship, 
because of the fact that she's scared of what he then might start to bring out. Yeah. But she didn't actually, because if this was Boris, Boris would have gone full on dagger <laughs> and just, just absolutely, you know, pivoted to deflect attention away from him. She didn't actually do that. And she oh, did yeah. say, well, one of the things she did say as a main thing was that she made clear she has not changed her fundamental position that yeah. the economic priority is growth. Yeah. So she's kind of like holding on and there wasn't a great deal of information. I think the market had been waiting for this all day and I was looking yeah. through and I was like, okay, there's like multiple ways in which she can trim and, and create, you know, uh, free up that black hole of what was 60 billion or so but she's just come out and literally talked about the the 18 billion in corporation tax cuts being reversed which goes against her own platform of course yeah. which is what rishi was pushing um she talked about the, the two things that they were saying from a market perspective is the down payment she was referring to that as i could nod to perhaps there's more reversals to come but they haven't really thought of what detail and context that that's going to happen and then the other thing um was about spending will not grow as quickly as planned she said yeah so they were the only bits that really stood out um yeah i mean they the all that's happened in terms of that mini budget what has changed other than now the chancellor um is that they've scrapped that 45 percent the idea of getting rid of the 45% tax band for the rich and then now, you know, doing a U-turn on corporation tax. So corporation tax will rise from 19% to 25%, right? So, so, so that's it. But certainly the, the corporation tax one, that is going to hurt Liz Truss because she, that's like a cornerstone piece of her mm. kind of campaign when she was campaigning to be leader of the party. Um, and, and that, look, she's, created her own downfall here by the spectacular sort of ill thought out um way they went about that budget and now she's having to just peel it all back just to stay alive so she's entirely kind of you know sacrificing her own political ethos just to cling on to power and as i said well no you said Technically, can the Conservative Party get her out? And, and the answer is probably no, right? But and the, so the only way to do it is the cabinet ministers just resign. It's the only way. That's what happened to Boris in the end. So keep an eye out for cabinet ministers resigning. But obviously, Liz Truss is hoping <laughs> that's a line now drawn and let's move on. I mean, she's hoping that. Of course, that's incredibly naive. This definitely isn't a line drawn and we're all going to move on now. This is going to yeah. hound her. And I don't know, I guess she does get hounded out at some point. But I'm looking at markets and... Yeah, I um, think that they say, as you look at that, that's, yeah. this is the definitive part of what right. will seal her fate. Yeah. What, what, what do markets do now? Right. So that's that. it's markets that have forced this whole episode because right. they, you know reacted phenomenally badly to the budget, right? So what's happened today, just today, mm. um, yields, so if we talk about bond yields, and kind of that's where all the action's been, right? Um, I'm looking at the 30-year government bond yield, okay? That's all that stuff around the kind of pension funds and everything else where the yield spiked above 5% last week. It then kind of came off and came down. This morning, off the news that Quasi's on a flight back from the States and is going to get sacked, of that news, bond yields dropped um, and continued to drop from last week's peak. And so just today, the first half of today, it dropped from 4.6% all the way down to about 4.25%, which is a big move, by the way, in just in a few hours. Now it's reversed the whole lot. So bond yields have reversed all of that downside from earlier on. They're now back up above 4.6%, new highs for the session. So bond yields are saying, Liz Truss, what the hell are you doing? Get out of office because you're not responsible to govern. That's what bond yields are saying. I'm looking at the currency markets. And if you look at the pound against the dollar and how that's been fluctuating, and it's the same thing, but in reverse, 
the pound was strengthening this morning um, and now it's all come off. And yeah, it's reversed. So the pound is now down on lows for the session. Still, I would point out quite a bit above where we were trading last week. I mean, we got down to 10, below 104. That's the pound versus the dollar um, last week or a couple of weeks ago, sorry, I should say, um, when the mini budget was first announced. Um, and we're, we're still up above the 111 handle as I speak. But yeah, a little bit of sterling weakness, but it's the bond yields that look to be more interesting for in my mind. So yeah, yields moving higher, the pound moving lower, the markets are saying that trust has got to go. Do you think there's any um, connection to Jeremy Hunt? He was uh, the former health and foreign secretary. It's probably not the, everyone's cup of tea in terms of his successes over the years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess she's gone for him just because he's, he's a hugely experienced politician mm. and indeed cabinet minister and has held, if you want to say, that the, the two other big offices, mm. which are foreign secretary and, and health secretary. Health secretary, obviously, these days is one of the big ones, of course. But um, so, yeah, I think he's probably just, he's seen as that kind of, super experienced person who can come in and balance off her inexperience. I, I can only assume that's mm. the strategy. Yeah, because the only other person I heard tabled late morning was Siji Javid. Again. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess he's too tight with Rishi. Yeah, well, this is it. He, he, he might have been asked, actually. Maybe he said no. Mm. Maybe he's binding, because who would want to who would want to yeah, jump on the truss yeah. trolley when uh, the wheels have already come off? I mean, well, look, I mean, looking at the charts on. now, I mean, you mentioned the reversal, and I think that's definitely a contributing factor, but stocks have also, not on this news, yeah, of course, but we'll get to it in a minute because stocks ramped yesterday after they initially tanked on CPI, which we'll delve into. But I don't feel my spidey senses are tingling for this. So you're saying markets aren't like really reacting to this. It's just a little bit of reaction. No, I think markets, I think we're going to have a sell-off for the rest of this afternoon and maybe I'll have egg on my face, but I don't like the setup of how the charts look across the board at the moment. You're talking about the UK markets or globally here? Global, US right. stocks yeah. as, um, in particular. I just don't like the vibes that I'm getting, <laughs> which is... Uh, a very <laughs> untechnical way of summarizing. But you know, when you, I guess when you've watched markets for a long time, you sometimes just get these feelings where, uh, particularly yeah. as well, as I said, we'll get to, because I do want to talk about the Bank of England a little bit before that. But yeah. after a big ramp day, like we had yesterday, that never leaves me with a particularly strong feeling about the second day to follow that up. But let, we'll, yeah. let's get to that in a sec. Tell me about... The Bank of England, because I caught one of your posts on LinkedIn. And again, yeah, this was an extension of while I was away and they had that whole fallout in the in the, the pension space. And then the Bank yeah. of England, I saw a comment. I think you said it that Andrew Bailey told pension funds, you got three days to get out. Yeah. So what, what's he talking about? And why is that such a powerful statement? Well, and by the way, the three days to get out will this is the last day of yep. the three. So it's actually markets close in what, an hour and a It's, hour it's and already a half. done. They've already had their last auction. Uh, is that right? So that's it. Yep. Done, right? So yeah, three days ago. 130 so, million. He, they just again? 130 million. Is that all? Yeah, the previous one prior to that was 3.1 billion. Yeah, there, there was one big day, but it's pretty much been the only big day. So look, what are they doing? Well, this is the Bank of England's emergency move following the budget um, when uh, bond markets just went into meltdown and UK government bond yields surged to kind of crazy levels. And this had this knock-on impact on pension funds and how they go about their business. There's this thing called liability-driven investments. I'm not going to go into it again now. We talked about it in the pod a couple of weeks ago. Um, but ultimately, it's resulting in pension funds having to essentially liquidate 
assets to to raise cash to pay margin calls uh, for their swap strategies that they're running, right? But the point is that obviously a lot of the assets that pension funds own are, are bonds, government bonds, UK gilts. And so they're having to sell their gilts to raise the cash, but it's the gilts being sold drives prices down and drives yields up. So this, the selling of those gilts is that vicious cycle because it makes yields surge more, which means then their margin calls are even larger. So the Bank of England stepped in and said, look, we'll come in and provide some buy side um, liquidity in this market. Because if, you, if you're in a market and everyone's selling, well, the collapses, right? You need, for every, for every person selling, you can't sell unless there's a counterparty that's buying. But what happens if no one wants to buy? Well, then this is where markets just collapse, right? So the Bank of England stepped in to avoid the collapse and said, all right, we'll buy. And normally they'd be expected to be what's called the buyer of last resort, right? Where they're stepping in and going, bang, we are stopping this market falling. We're drawing a line. We're going to be the buyers. And we've got unlimited money. Or, well, in this case, they said we're going to use 65 billion, okay? Um, and so... That's the case. And so everyone thought, oh, thank God, relief. OK, the pension funds aren't going to collapse. The Bank of England, they've, they're, they're coming to the rescue yet again. But actually, that's not what's turned out to have happened, because this 65 billion that they've said they were going to spend to prop up this market, they haven't got anywhere near. I think they're less than 10 billion, actually. Um, all in all, of the 65, it's less than 10 that they've spent. And everyone's like, what? what's going on? And it's not like yields have dramatically reversed. And what's going on here, I, I think, is part of this. It's, it's part of a much bigger thing, in my opinion. But that bigger thing is the era of central banks just always coming to the rescue. And bailing everyone out, you can make you know, you can make the biggest errors, the biggest mistakes. You can take the most ridiculous risk. You can, you can do whatever you want because the consequences in the end are, don't worry, the central bank's got your back. And so this has been the case time and time and time and time again. Quantitative easing programs, you know, um, etc. And and it's got to the point here in the UK now that. They're, they're, they're bailing out governments, right? They're bailing out government incompetency. And this is where you get this slight um, kind of conflict because a government wants to stay in power. They want to win votes. They want to be elected. So sure, Truss's kind of mini budget of tax cuts is populist. And so fine, that's a good thing for the government if their objective is to get re-elected. But of course, We've just had a COVID crisis and debt levels are just through the roof. So in the end, you know, but but this is where government, uh, sorry, central banks have just been propping it up, propping it up, propping it up. So I think this is a stand from the central bank to say, you know what, we're going to, we're not going to continue to do this indefinitely, you know, just because the government's messed up here. You know, we're not going to ride to the rescue just because pension funds have got these com complicated investment strategies. You know, that's that's their choice. Pension funds, it's it's their choice that they're running these strategies. It's their risk that they're taking. They're not stupid, these pension funds. They know the risks. Fine, they weren't expecting the yield moves we've seen, but it should be in their risk models. And if it's not, well, I'm sorry. Whose fault is that? It's theirs. And it shouldn't be the central bank that just comes along and just bails them out all the time. So what the central bank have been doing for the last couple of weeks in this emergency window is, is saying, yeah, we are buying. We are buyers. We are going to prevent this market from collapsing. But we're not just going to buy at crazy high prices and let you off the hook. We'll buy, but we'll buy at very low prices. You're going to have to wear a lot of pain if you want to use us as your exit point from this strategy. Um, and as you've seen, hardly anybody sold. So what does that tell you? That tells you that, okay, there isn't a pension fund meltdown crisis here, because if there was, they'd be selling to the central bank, even at their low prices. They've chosen not to. And that speaks volumes, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. And 
think you're absolutely right. I agree with that conclusion. Um, Andrew Bailey, then. I know yeah. you've never really been a big fan. I've been a big hater on the pod, actually. Yeah, I'm not. It, I, we'll, we'll see. I think yeah, on he's my done post, a good job here. He's bold, well, bold, and the brave. I know the um, like the press, like the default with Bailey is mm. from the press and from myself. I will definitely say is, you know, always what the hell's he doing? You know, lack of credibility, making mistakes, not believable, and so the press kind of. I guess, jumped on it again when he said on Tuesday, pension funds, we're not extending this emergency window. You've got three days, get out. Um, and then the press were all over it. Going, oh my God, what's he doing? This is going to be a disaster. Bond market's going to collapse. The whole thing's going to implode. But I, I actually, this is easily, 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 easily the best thing he's ever done. In my opinion, this is, if he pulls this off, I, I think it would be it will be he'll go from here from zero to hero in my mind. This this could be, and I don't know yet whether it'll work, but it could be one of the most dramatic kind of monetary policy stands. The U turn in the theme of U turns. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a, it's this him just going look. Just I'm stopping this crazy train that we're on. Mm. I'm, I'm pulling the brake. I guess the uh, one thing from, um, <clears throat> if I was thinking about it from a PR perspective, um, I didn't see the live conference with Bailey, but given the language that was adopted, I can imagine it was delivered in a very authoritative way. And it's almost the opposite of what we've just seen from Liz Truss. Yeah. Which is, there's a heightened degree of uncertainty, I'm sure, with Bailey of, am I doing the right thing? When I say these words, will the bond market freak out? Obviously, there's a tangible risk of that happening because you don't know until you say it and you yeah. find out pretty quickly, hence, you know, the way markets react. But I guess this is one of the things that um, I guess is so important about that leadership role is even if you're unsure, even if you're scared, if you're anxious, it's not your job as the point man to show those types of feelings um because that, that was exactly what one of the um journalists was talking about from some of the initial whatsapps that were firing in the background when she came on stage it was like that's it's just not good enough <laughs> yeah i've never seen someone exit stage left so fast mm. after that press conference she lit i mean it she was sprinting to get out of there it was like the most uncomfortable thing I've seen for a, for a while. And yeah, that's not what you want from your leader. Um, it's got to be confident, assertive. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe Bailey's just got incredibly thick skin these days, taking the bashing from you every episode. The, the thing is, right, that markets are so powerful and they basically, they tell you what to do based on how they behave, right? And that's really what's been happening for years. Central banks and governments, right? If you make a mistake, markets will tell you, and then you need to reverse and change, right? Um, if central banks say, right, we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna start hiking rates, and markets freak out, and they go, oh God, all right, fine, we won't. But I think this is Bailey trying to just reverse the tables and to say, markets, you're not gonna dictate to me what we're gonna do. We're going to dictate the terms to you. And it worked in so much as bond yields dropped from 4.5% to below 4% after Bailey said his thing. It's only now trust has kind of flipped it and is on the way back up again. But yeah, from Bailey's point of view, if, he, if this works, and look, he's got trust to deal with here. So it, whilst he may have played the perfect move, um, maybe trust will kind of ruin it anyway but hmm. from bailey's point of view yeah that's the best thing he's ever done in my opinion shout out to andy if you're listening <laughs> um Wait, he's no mario draghi all right let's get this <laughs> very clear um he's not like my man mario just, in more ways than just managing markets as well <laughs> very different characters but um let's talk about uh, Thursday's move in the U.S. equity market, 
because let me kind of paint the scene. So all week we've been waiting for one official data point to hit. Very important one because it's the greatest weightest factor, basically, that um, builds the perception of what the Fed are going to do. And a rate hike from the Fed come early November of the magnitude of 75 basis points. That was priced in before. It's priced in now. It's not about the November meeting. It's about that terminal rate, which we've talked about before in a previous episode, which is about where do rate rates go beyond this? How high do they go? And where's the resting point when we get to the top? So everyone was waiting CPI, the Consumer Price Index report from the US um, on Thursday. And that came in at 8.2% on the headline, which was down from the previous 8.3, was 0.1 above expectations. But let's just park that because the one I'm sure that you can give some more color on is what's under the bonnet of the inflation reports when you start um, taking out some of the more volatile components. So typically food, energy, people look at the core reading and that rose to a 40-year high, 6.6% up from 6.3% and above street expectations. Immediate reaction, well, it was the kind of everything dumps. <laughs> so stocks down, gold down, bonds down. Uh, the only thing moving up really in that scenario is the US dollar, of course. Um, so that was the first part, was quite a, a very uh, forceful move lower in US equities. But if you fast forward, trying to look at the time frame, it was within about two and a half hours yeah. or so. Yeah. We'd taken the whole move back and then added some, which, you know, you and I didn't have the time yesterday to sit there for the entire afternoon just watching tick for tick. Um, but when we came out of a meeting and we looked then and it's like, what? And then I always know there's a, you know, the one thing that always makes me smile is when I, I'll check my, my Slack <laughs> messages just before I go to bed, uh, you know, because I'm a good employee, just in case there's any <laughs> last minute messages I need to field before I go to sleep. And then lo and behold, Piers Curran <laughs> messaging me about the clothes on Wall Street. What happened? <laughs> Did I miss something? What's going on? So I know you've still got your eye in <laughs> when you go home. You know, talk about my layer. I don't know what's going on when you go home. <laughs> messaging me at half nine, 10 p.m. about the clothes. So, so why did we rally? I know there was a couple of things to, yeah. to talk about. So, I mean, one of the most crazy days. Let me just talk about that in a second, because uh, about 10 minutes ago, you said you were feeling a little bit funny about how the charts were shaping up. Hmm. Um, so since you said that in the last 10 minutes, the Nasdaq's sold off about 150 points. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you still got it. Um, but... Let's talk about yesterday. Um, so yeah, and, and if I talk about the Nasdaq, all right, mm. when we talk about, it, but but you can you can swap that in for any other stock market basically because they all did the same thing. But if I just talk about the Nasdaq, which is a bit more sensitive to inflation data than the S and P, the, the more broader based S and P, and that's just because tech stocks are just more price sensitive to um, inflation. Um, so the Nasdaq, the inflation numbers hit and. Uh, the Nasdaq sold off from 10,850 um, to 10, let's just call it 10,450. I'm rounding things up and down here, but basically a 400 point sell off bang in pretty much a straight line straight away. And that initial reaction was because of the core CPI reading. And the core CPI reading, um, as you said, 6.6%, 40 year high, but I think more importantly, was higher than the March peak. So for core CPI, we had a big surge higher in the start of the year to 6.5% in March. Then it tracked lower for the next few months, which is what led to the stock market rally in the summer. Um, and now in the last couple of months, it's just gone step, step, right back up and above the spring high. And so the first reaction in markets is, oh, my God, this is a disaster. This inflation crisis, I mean, it's definitely not over. 
Um, the Fed are going to have to carry on hiking rates at 75 basis points per meeting till God knows when, right? And the terminal rate that you were talking about is now going to be higher and it's our doom and gloom and stock markets collapse, okay? Then the devil's in the detail and, and it is difficult with inflation because there's so many elements to it and there's so many different components and there's headline inflation and there's core and then there's goods and there's services and um, so it's, it's, it is difficult to kind of delve into the data, but what happened in markets after that 400 point sell-off and the NASDAQ sell-off paused, then it started to push back higher and bounce. And not only did it rebound the whole lot, so a 400 point sell-off, 400 point rally, then into the close where I was kind of messaging you, it then added another like 200 points on top of that. So basically 400 point sell off, 600 point rally, um, finishing on the highs for the session. No other news. Because I was thinking, hang on a minute, maybe I missed some news later on, nothing through the inflation. Maybe there was something else that happened that led to that, that bounce, but there wasn't anything. So when I delved into the inflation situation, it became a little bit more clear, I think. Um, so if you look at the, if we just took, take core inflation, that's taking out food and energy. Okay, so what you've got left, and, and in core inflation, you can kind of split it into goods or services. Okay, um, two things on the goods side, and I think this is probably the most powerful catalyst for that rebound yesterday. If you look at the goods side, so stuff like what we saw was shipping costs have now started to fall. Uh, commodity prices are falling. Um, we've had then what we call a, a real buildup in inventories. Okay, this is where companies are stockpiling uh, product. So that's where they're manufacturing product and then they're, maybe they're sticking it in the warehouse that's ready for goods to be sold and shipped, right? And the, or the inventory levels of components or whatever, right? They've, they've been building and building to super high levels, which is normally a sign that sales are starting to weaken right and so it's perhaps a lead indicator that companies are going to start to buy less so that demand side of the inflation situation there's signals that it's going to weaken and what we saw with the goods inflation element of the core inflation reading we now have goods disinflation so actually Net over all goods in the basket, prices now dropped. And that's the first time that's happened um, since 2020. So goods inflation is now negative, right? So that's a clear sign that maybe this inflation crisis has peaked or is peaking, okay? So then we look at the, but, but hang on then, if goods prices went down, why was the inflation print so high? And why was it higher than expected? So it's all about the services side, okay? Services inflation definitely did not go down. Now, the biggest component of the services side of inflation is shelter. So everything to do with your house and you living in a house, right? And that came in super hot. And that's been, the, that's been one of the elements of the inflation basket that's been really driving this inflation spike right so the the shelter portion of the inflation basket was up 0.7 percent both in august and in september actually now that shelter portion that makes up half of the uh core um services okay so that's a really important one and that's the one that's pushing higher i'll come back to that in a sec medical care which makes up 12 percent of the core services that went up big time weirdly because of mostly because of surging costs of eye appointments. Don't know what's going on with eye appointments, but the price has jumped. But the point is, because there's no obvious reason, it's like, well, that's probably not going to last then. That, that's probably just a temporary thing, right? So looking ahead now, you know, what, what's inflation going to be next month? What it will be at the end of the year? And it's like, well, okay, what's driving it up now? And are those factors sustainable? So Medical care, probably not going to continue to be a factor that's pushing inflation higher. Uh, transportation services, that's 10% of the core services side of the basket. That shot up 1.9%. That was a lot 
bigger jump than we saw in August, where it was only 0.5%. And again, it's a bit tricky as to, as to why, or to kind of judge why that's happened. And, and there's no evidence to suggest it will continue to happen, right? So look, if you've got goods prices now declining, if you've got medical care and transportation services spiking, but for no good reason, so probably won't again going forwards, then really all it comes down to is shelter. Basically, shelter is the last portion of this basket that's driving prices higher. I think that's why markets rebounded yesterday, because a lot of the elements in the basket are really flashing that in the future, inflation is going to start to come back down. But it does leave shelter. And will that continue to rise? Now, last thing, last point about shelter. Um, shelter CPI is calculated using rental data. So how much does it cost to rent? Okay. Now, in the CPI basket, that shelter component is looking at um, existing rents, rental amounts, and then new rental contracts. Okay. Now, if you took out the existing, there are other readings that aren't used in the CPI inflation basket, but are used, you can find elsewhere. There's other kind of measures that get rid of existing. It's just what are the new rental contracts? How are they being priced? Because that's obviously a much better lead indicator, right? If you've signed up to a two-year rent agreement, well, then you can't change the price, right? So the price isn't going to go anywhere. But it's the new deals that are getting signed now. The prices are starting to come down. So the lead indicator by looking at new rental costs is showing that, and the lag's about nine months, by the way, the lag between um, CPI shelter measures uh, and actual rental costs in new deals being done is about nine months. So basically, the long and the short of it is, it looks like the shelter market is turning as well now, if you just look at new rent deals, and therefore, we're kind of nine months away from the whole shelter CPI component starting to come all the way back down. So we still got nine months, but the point in the way markets operate is we don't wait for nine months to see if it actually happens. We kind of look into the finer detail and the more lead indicators to see if it's beginning to happen. And if we're happy it's beginning to happen, right, let's start pricing it in. So this is why markets rebounded yesterday. Yeah, and I was, I was looking at other rationale that was trying to be pinned to the move. I think <clears throat> fundamentally, definitely. I think there perhaps there's a couple of other elements that exist in an intraday environment that can exacerbate these types of wild price movements. And so four, there's four other things that were tabled. So feel okay. free to add any source to um, to any of these as I described them. Chart support, mm. option hedges, so unwinding short positions. Right. Those perhaps piled in on the back of the inflation figure on first instance. Yeah. Um, earning season. What about then, earning season? Well... I think I saw BlackRock finish up like six and a half percent or something yesterday, but I think that's tied up in some of the move. But I, yeah. I don't. We haven't even begun earnings season, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that's a bit much. Um, and then rule-based strategies, just exacerbating some Whoa. of the move. The only thing I can think of by that reference is perhaps there's short-term intraday participants running automated systems on momentum-based trading and then the momentum was down to start with well in terms in terms of the <laughs> the the speed of the recovery and some when it added yeah and then you know yeah. so i don't know i guess the main things to for the people listening i guess there's a couple of different um types some will be traders uh and i think actually there's a couple of things i think <laughs> One thing is, is that when you get a situation, if you're looking at intraday markets like yesterday, um, I can say as, off, as, as tempting as it can be to, to jump in and just ride the reversal, um, I'd say that's a highly risky strategy, more broadly speaking, because 
what you described about the CPI report all makes complete crystal clear sense. The ability for you to really make that assessment in real time yeah. is impossible. <laughs> um, yeah. Certainly in very, very tight timeframes. Yeah. Um, and your initial rationale is based on then buying into a market that fundamentally doesn't make sense to the initial interpretation which is never a good thing, never a good place to be more often or not. Um, which, which is the second point, which is, well, if you are trading intraday, then probably the best course of action is if you see the types of volatility, I did have a stat, I think I saw it somewhere, someone tweeted it, where it's like the, the down up move has led to extreme level of volatility, probably your best served not trading. <laughs> <laughs> Because even though you mentioned a 600-point move in a market, which sounds very appetizing, you could be 600 points on the wrong side of that move. Yeah. Um, and you kind of want to pick, you know, you want to pick opportunities where the probabilities hopefully are leaning in your favor. Um, you know, you're not rolling the dice here trying to just chase markets. So... That's for the intraday. I think beyond that, you know, for anyone who's more interested in like the mechanics from a, a top level picture, I think exactly as you described makes makes sense, both from a longer term investment point of view, for a fund manager point of view, and for a student to understand about these things. Um, you know, I think it was a, a good explanation because now when you look at the market, actually I'm looking at the NASDAQ now and it's trading scratch. Yeah, from where we were when the CPI bomb dropped yesterday. I just noticed that as well. <laughs> so it's gone nowhere. So basically, if you had a, you know, if you had a big night out and then had a big sleep and a hangover and missed work yesterday, you'd be absolutely exactly yeah. where you were before That's any of this madness happened. <laughs> so one, um, of, one of my favorite things is that, like, when you get a market episode like yesterday, hmm. and it doesn't happen often. One of my favorite things is then to um, is to read the mainstream financial press and just for entertainment comedy value, yeah. just read some of the attempts that the journos are making at trying to explain what happened. When it's super hard to explain and blatantly, I think unless you've been a trader and you've been right in amongst it and for years, then it's it's almost yeah it's just seems like impossible to explain but the journo's job that's what they've got to do and i love some of the mm. some of the things they come out with to try and explain it i find hilarious um but but yeah um definitely i don't know obviously we're selling off now i guess the bigger question here's a question for you is this because one angle from yesterday was, well, if the market can't sell off mm. on the back of more bad inflation data, well, maybe maybe that's it. Maybe we're at a bottom. There just aren't any sellers left. Anybody who did want to sell, they've already sold. Even more bad inflation data and the market doesn't go down. So is that a signal? Well, okay, maybe maybe this is a bottom. What do you think to that? Mm. yeah i mean i've always been a perma perma bull <laughs> but you know after the the 30 what was it 37 38,000 got smashed in the s p <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a little bit um less inclined to be talking it up but I, I guess put it this way a lot of the bank stuff i've been reading i was posting something from bank of america on the amplify me linkedin page so shameless plug you should follow that account because we put stuff out me and the team about you know bank calls things like that really useful um for when you're interviewing at these places but bank of america were basically saying along the lines of you know there's more pain to come and i think a lot of them like morgan stanley i think is the same they're talking about corporate valuations are still too rich and need to come down and I guess that we, we're just about to begin earning season. So yeah. I think we've got an important couple of weeks ahead, which yeah. I think we could probably sell off into. Yeah. We've then got the midterms coming 
in what the first week of November. So I think I from a timing wise, and just given the 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 usual market reactions that we get post midterms as well. Now with this UK debacle coming, you know, I think we're over the worst. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> I think there's a lot of bad stuff that's happened. Yeah. And that's had its impact now. Yeah. So I think we, I, I'm more of the mind of we sell off short term next three weeks, month. I still think that then there's a little bit of time where the dust will settle on this. I mean, I just heard, saw a comment here from one of the Fed officials talking about four and a half to 5% likely the top of the Fed funds rate cycle, which I guess is in keeping with their guidance. But I yeah. think we hit first week, second week of November. You want to call? We'll sell off till then. And okay. then, then, then we hit that. That's when the bottom. So you think the midterms will in. provide the bottom? <laughs> I'm going to have to get out that GS bingo card that you, you had the other day and just see where we are on the, uh, <laughs> on the scorecard. Um, because then I think you, as well, those corporate valuations have got time to come down, be a bit more depressed. And the yeah. more depressed they become with this, you know, this greater sell-off that still might emerge, I think then you'll start to see. Well, I do, I do agree like, with the earnings season that's about to start. I mean, that's definitely going to be pretty significant i think um and it just got and it's not just their earnings for quarter three which mm. is probably going to come in week but it's really about their what what are these companies guiding for 2023 you know what's their guidance for 23 and how how bearish are they and how worried are they and especially in the u.s with the, the dollar being so uber strong so for these massive giant organizations that generate a lot of international revenues, that's that's really hurting. So I, yeah, I, it's interesting to see what they say about their 2023 guidance, and I think that may be the, the kind of most powerful force. And if it's if it's doom and gloom, then yeah, I think you're right. We may get another leg down um, over the next two three weeks. But on that earnings front, so it's some of the banks reporting today, right? Which is really just kicking off the season and then yes. what, who are reporting next so, week yeah without going into all of the numbers what i can say is that um i've posted actually on my linkedin my personal one so feel free to connect but i've on there i've put out the press releases as of every large financial institution reported in the last 48 hours jp morgan morgan stanley city wells fargo and blackrock was on thursday um, so the reason why this is super important, if you're a student listening and you're in the midst of the application season, which I know is very much well underway right now, either applying, writing cover letters, or at this point of the year, typically in interview or looming assessment centers, I think Will mentioned the other day, there's still students out there who won't be able to tell an employer the difference between the global markets division and the IBD division, yeah. which are like night and day. But beyond that, what I always try to say to students is that look, if you read one of these investor relation documents around corporate earnings from a JP Morgan, for example, or a Morgan Stanley, then essentially it gives you not just the top level performance of that business, it allows you to understand in a more granular fashion how each division is performing, of which are these specific divisions that you are applying to. It also allows you to do a competitive kind of landscape assessment of, okay, so how big is MS in this space compared to GS? Right. Or what actually, you know, why is a classic investment bank so different to a city or a Wells Fargo, for example? What's the commercial banking aspect of them? How big is it in context? And, you know, I always try to say to, to students is that, you know, if you were an employer, and you're employing someone to work in your company, let's say you owned your own small company, right? And you ask that famous question, what do you know about my company? You should be able to tell me, particularly I'm giving you public documentation of facts yeah. and figures of what exactly we do, what services we provide, what's our best product, how are we positioned in the market? If you are listening to this podcast and you can't answer those questions about the bank you're applying to, 
you're not probably not going to get that job. Yeah. So look, I've shared it all there. It's in one post. I'm going to circulate it in the, um, the market maker newsletter as well. Um, but look, I can only take a horse to water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But look, this is all to help. And, Wise words. You know, I think um, it doesn't take more than I would say 15 minutes to just have a little look over the document because generally people are concentrated on a specific division and you're going to be like much more educated and you'll feel much more confident and you will have that, uh, that special uh, differentiator from the other candidates then. So yeah, check I'll put, I'll drop the link in the show notes just to make life easier for everyone. Um, but yeah, earning season will pick up a bit of pace next week. Um, usually it's still a bit slow. You'll get the other financial names amongst some other firms, but then it's the week after it's then the busiest week of all of the season. And then probably the week after that is when we'll start. So we're probably talking like, I guess, late October, the apples, Amazons, alphabets, metas of the world. Uh, we'll probably come in about two weeks or so, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but yeah. We'll, we'll cover that when the time comes. The world might be a different place by then. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson will be prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, we'll leave it there uh, for this week. And we'll be back as ever uh, next week to talk over the main events of the week. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Piers. And have a good weekend. Yep. Cheers, guys. Bye.